Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com here Monday now, the 15th day, tax day, of April 2024. And yes, I have another cold. Great. All the traveling I did, I must have picked up something along the way. At least so far, this one hasn't knocked me out to where I can't talk, but who knows, maybe that's coming. So I'm going to try to keep this fairly short so you don't have to endure this cold sound that I have, and it's just good to make things as brief as possible, right? So today we're going to talk about the La Nina. It's coming, and with it, <clears throat> likely a very busy hurricane season. And I'm going to try to explain a little bit as to why that is the case. Why does La Nina typically herald in a uh, busier season? We'll get we'll get to that. First of all, way back at the beginning of 2024 on January the first. After everybody celebrated a wonderful end to 2023, hopefully, this is what the sea surface temperature anomalies look like. We were in a strong El Nino pattern, the abnormal warming of the tropical Pacific. We also had a very warm tropical and subtropical Atlantic. For the most part, at least the far north Atlantic, subtropics were actually a little bit cooler, technically speaking, but we were in this El Nino pattern, and that gave us a very interesting winter, another very wet time of it out west, and pretty stormy across a good deal of the rest of the country, except we didn't have a lot of nor'easters or big lake effect snows. We had a few, but nothing big time, no recurring pattern of cold, deep Arctic air in the northeast. But I'm going to tell you what, let's just paint this in with kind of a blue color. Uh, California was cooler and wetter, and lots of snowpack out there, so that was great. So yeah, we had the El Nino. Now, fast forwarding a few months, April 14th, the maps are always about a day old, or a day behind. So here we are yesterday, and we're just now starting to see the beginnings of this La Nina. And, of course, the Atlantic is remaining very warm relative to the long-term average. So let's just go back and forth for a little bit. There's the El Nino, definitely has faded, while the Atlantic has maintained its record warmth. So what has happened? Well, different global weather patterns have resulted in more easterly flow, so the winds blowing from the east to the west across the equatorial Pacific down here, stirring things up and getting the conveyor belt to run different. Because last year, and this is an oversimplification of it, just to try to explain it the best way I can, last year we had more westerly winds coming across the equatorial Pacific, and that created, I mean, because you got South America over here, <clears throat> over here, and among other reasons, you get downwelling, so that all the warm water in the West Pack kind of gets shoved into the deep subsurface waters, and you get an El Nino because you have westerly wind bursts going on. That has since changed. We have developed deep sub, uh, subsurface cold water pockets, and those cold water pockets are now starting to make it to the surface, especially here between the Galapagos Islands and South America, Colombia and Ecuador, and then off in the equatorial Pacific, a little bit of that transverse wave pattern starting to show up as the La Nina begins to split the seams there and make its way to the surface. What about 2022? I wanted to go back and look at two years ago. Boy, oh boy, the Pacific was very cold relative to average. The deep tropical Atlantic, not so much. Now, we remember what happened that year. A lot of the warmth was focused way up here, especially later in the hurricane season. Very anomalous warmth. In other words, it was warmer then the long-term average, uh, that was in August, September, and so forth. And we had sort of a weird year. We had, quote, only Fiona and Ian to make big impacts here for parts of North America. I mean, they were big enough, don't get me wrong. But it looked like 2022 was going to be this gangbuster hurricane season because we did have this cool Pacific, a fairly warm Atlantic. Again, this is April of 22. But the big difference was, let's get some red in here, like Bob Ross. Let's get a little bit of red up here. Uh, 
that's enough of the Bob Ross. But yeah, we had a lot of red, just paints of red up there. You remember that? I'll show that next time around. We'll go back and look at different hurricane seasons and what the anomaly patterns were. But I remember how much deep red uh, we had in the far North Atlantic, and it sort of distorted the pattern. The warm anomalies weren't where you normally look for them. Remember, we're looking for similarities to past busy seasons. There is a fingerprint. There are fingerprints, plural, over history. And we can go back and look and see what is the profile that gives us a busy hurricane season. 2022 was busy, but it could have been busier. But things were just kind of weird that year. So let's just keep on looking at different La Nina clues. We visit our friends over here at storm2k.org, a supporter of our work and a bunch of good friends of ours at Storm2k. They've got this running thread for this year, 2024. Inso, that's El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon. <clears throat> and they note in the headline here, the title thread or whatever, La Nina Watch is in effect. CPC weekly update, the Nino 3.4 region, which is roughly eh, this area right through here, something like that, is down from that very warm back in January, as I was showing you. It has definitely cooled off. And as they note over here at Storm 2K, we are down to just a little bit under 1 degree Celsius, 0.9 Celsius, all right? So we have dropped off quite a bit. I showed you that on these two maps here, very obvious. Now let's look at it from the, the way people are talking about it. Lots of different posts over here. We can keep track of this. This goes back about a week into this ongoing thread, and we can see the very warm Atlantic over here and the Pacific starting to cool off. There's lots of tools out there, and we all watch it very, very close. There's a tweet from Ben Knoll. And this is a neat one here. Cyclone I, Luis there posting the seven-day change. I like these maps where you can actually detect a shorter-term change in something. And in this case, the seven-day change in the... Well, that didn't work as expected. That's okay. But you get to see what I'm talking about. It looks like a La Nina is already there. But no, this is the seven-day change. So even just over a week's time... I would assume that's the 1st of April till about April 8th or 9th or so. There was a pretty marked drop-off in the sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. Very easy to see that. And then we got all sorts of other discussions here. We can look at, here's another post from Luis, Cyclone I. Down in Puerto Rico he is. And you got this sort of uh, chart that you can follow. And look where we were. This is great. All the way back at the beginning of the year, at least 2 degrees Celsius. That's a terrible 2, but you get the idea. <clears throat> 2 degrees Celsius. Let's just highlight it instead of write it. And off it has gone down into the dumps. Now, right there, that 0.9, a definite drop-off. So what does that do? Why is that important? You're taking that heat content out of the tropical Pacific, you don't have as much moisture, you don't have as much deep convection, as much rising motion, and that rising motion and the convection eventually leads to shear in the Caribbean and parts of the tropical Atlantic. It's just this giant feedback mechanism that once you get a very warm tropical Pacific in place, it leads to all sorts of weird things happening, like a big monkey wrench getting thrown into the overall short-term climate signal. So we can watch this and we can see on the charts, the maps and the graphs, the heat content and the surface temperatures all getting removed now from various methods through various methods and we're dipping. It's going down. So we're headed towards La Nina. The evidence is still there. Moving through last week, post eclipse time, that was the 8th. Boy, what a day that was. Aren't you glad, I guess some of you, that there's no more real eclipse stuff in your feed you know, it was exciting, but let's move on. I agree. It's time to move on and look for hurricane season stuff and severe weather. So on that note, CPC issuing their latest guidance. Probabilities of La Nina increasing as we go through the remaining months. 
That, my friends, is the peak of hurricane season, tri-monthly era. Is that an era or just whatever? I'll call it an era. The tri-monthly uh, period, that's a better word, of August, September, October, 80% chance that we reach La Nina thresholds. So I'm reinforcing all of this because it's very important to see what is happening. The very warm Atlantic, and we can see that here, versus the cooling of the tropical Pacific. And we can see again that reflected in the seven day change, or this is 15 day change here. The Atlantic's cooled a little bit, otherwise it's just kind of stayed the same, but a dramatic drop off in the tropical Pacific water temperatures. All right, we'll move on along. Now the SOI is interesting. I show you that sometimes. The Southern Oscillation Index, and Luis was asking there, why is the SOI dipping and going down? That's typically associated with more westerly wind bursts. It's the pressure pattern across the tropical Pacific, and it's been going down recently. Normally, we see the SOI go up. It's very positive, and that gives us more of a La Nina background state. But once in a while, you do get these different anomalies that will show up, wrinkles in the overall path, and with MJO activity or whatever, just sometimes you get something that sort of puts a roadblock, temporarily anyway, or a speed bump is a better way to put it. Roadblocks can be temporary. They certainly can. But Luis was right to point that out. Why is the SOI dipping when we are you know, headed towards La Nina and the 3.4 region is cooling? And then people answer that. And some of these folks are very smart. This is what we call crowdsourcing. It is. It's true. You get a group of people. You see it on Reddit. Uh, sometimes that can be the Wild West. Not so much at Storm 2K. It's a lot more consolidated with some very smart and intuitive people that know what they are looking for. And the bump in the SOI, really not much to really notice right now. It is interesting, though, overall. And... Um, Finally, the last page of this ongoing thread, and this is important. <clears throat> this was updated today, this morning, so very timely there. These are your different regions, Nino 4, 3.4, 3, 1.2. And those are just areas of the tropical Pacific that are divided up to understand. Again, climate people come up with some very simple ways of labeling things. But notice, this is the point. Way back in 2023, up, up, up we went, we peaked, and now we're coming down. Up, 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 down, you see the pattern here, in the Nino 1.2 area, which is right off of South America. I'll show you where that is geographically. Bear with me. Here we are yesterday. That is the Nino 1.2 area, roughly. Again, the 3.4 area sitting out here, roughly. And everything is declining. Now... Why did I spend so much time on that? That's like, well, we already know we're headed towards the La Nina. What's the big deal? It is very important because what we are doing is we are dropping the ability of the tropical Pacific to create, say it with me now, deep, sustained convection. And so that will mean a reduction across this area of tall tropical thunderstorms in the long term that create eventually wind shear across the tropical Atlantic, especially the Caribbean and the western parts of the Atlantic tropical regions. Typically out here, neither El Nino nor La Nina has any impact in, you know, as we go back and look through the history of things. So yes, this is important. We're losing that ability here to create upward motion in the tropical Pacific. It won't mean that, the, it doesn't mean there won't be any but it's going to be a lot less, and we're going to be focusing it all through here as time mar marches forward. And we're only 30 days away from the tropical weather outlooks starting up again, and that's important because we're only about 40-something days away, 48 or whatever it is, until hurricane season. And just to show you, this is what a, a big El Nino can do. This is 2015. Let's use black again to make this pop. This is... August 20th, the day the bell rings, so to speak. 2015, tons of extra heat in the Pacific pretty much everywhere. And what do you notice? It is just out of the deep tropics 
that the corridor of the warmest water temperatures, the anomalies anyway, were focused in the deep tropics down here. They weren't really prevalent. A lot of warm water relative to average in the subtropics and in the far north Atlantic. So the pattern was very distorted. This was not a good sign for hurricane activity to be prevalent in 2015. A very positive sign for a strong hurricane season in the Pacific, and that is exactly what we had. All right, so then we go to last year, and this was incredible because you had the strong El Nino and a very warm entire North Atlantic. All of it, especially, and this is another important piece, way up here in the far northern Atlantic was warmer relative to average. The positive anomalies were much more prevalent way up here in the far north Atlantic, well removed from the deep tropics. So you had all of this competing upward motion. We had storms kind of everywhere, short-lived, and the El Nino helped to maybe thwart the pattern a little bit so that we didn't have long track hurricanes. Just Everything just kind of stacked against the Atlantic overperforming last year, yet we still had a couple of pretty big impact systems, including Idalia. So what I am most concerned about to kind of bring this all home is the fact that this year, and let's go back to the current setup, we've got the La Nina taking shape, and then the warmth is not all up here. It is right where you would look for it so far. Again, April 14th. What's this, what is this going to look like August 20th? I don't know. We'll see. Most of the climate models agree that it is going to still look like this. So you have this horseshoe of warmth, cooler subtropics, so the warmth is focused where it should be, and the developing La Nina. That, my friends, is exactly why, and you can see it here in the cross-section. Uh, there's the La Nina coming, just more reinforcing info for you. And that is why we see, oh, by the way, I wanted to show you this. Sorry, I forgot. Really cool. I'll put a link to this from climate.gov. This right here, done in this cool sort of 3D animation, that's pretty top shelf right there. You can really see how things work. Uh, I love the projections and infographics that we have available. So that all brings me to this, finally, to bring it home for you. This is why so many of these groups... Ten of them already submitted now to seasonalhurricanepredictions.org, part of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Phil Klotzbach involved with this, Dr. Klotzbach. And you just mouse across these. Eleven predicted from the University of Missouri. I didn't know that they did hurricane seasonal forecasting. Now I do. These are hurricanes, by the way. Eleven predicted. Arizona's predicted between 9 and 13. Tropical storm risk planting their flag at 11, the North American Multimodal Ensemble, 10 to 13, Weather Bell, old Joe Bastardi, 14 to 16, 15 predicted, I guess, is 15, whatever's the range, ECMWF, not a person, but a climate model, 8 to 14, 11, I guess, is the middle ground, and you see how, you know, it goes. <clears throat> Colorado State, 11, so forth and so on. I don't really know a lot about GWO, so and it's, I know a little bit, but the other university-based ones that have, and folks that have been around and they publish a lot of hindcast data, I typically put more weight on those entities. Uh, but you get the idea, and look, it's real simple. Most of these forecasts, with the exception of GWO, are in the high numbers, like well above average because of all of this stuff that I just showed you. The La Nina is coming, and all of this is going to add up, apparently, to a very busy hurricane season. So La Nina does matter, and the fact that it is on its way, and the Atlantic stay is anomalously warm, and we are now within 45, 50 days of hurricane season, starting on a calendar, I think it will probably start in May, and by the way, too, it's not going to be that much longer. We're going to be, need to be watching the long-term GFS, especially, to see when we start when we might start to develop the CAG events, the Central American Gyres, where you get that westerly wind coming out of the East Pack, 
easterly winds coming across the Caribbean to get that gyre. We're not too far away from those shenanigans starting to show up <clears throat> in some of the long-range guidance. All right? So that is the hurricane side of things. La Nina is coming. We need to be prepared. And before I wrap this up, I'm going to tell you about some really cool things that we're going to do to help you get prepared. But first, it is severe weather season. Let's don't ignore that. Enhanced risk, slight risk, big chunk of the nation's midsection, but not to be outdone from Kentucky over to parts of the Tidewater region, Chesapeake Bay area. Be alert. That's all I'm asking. So many distractions, TikTok videos, YouTube shorts to watch, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. You know, like distractions galore, plus your everyday lives. You don't want to miss this kind of stuff. Pretty high tornado threat in parts of Kansas and Nebraska. The chasers will be out. Be careful out there. Seriously. And then the hail. Ooh, I'm getting interested in that. And I'll talk about that more in a minute, too. So this is today. Please, please, please pay attention. Stay alert. Here's tomorrow. It shifts east, and it could be rather nasty there along parts of Missouri and Illinois, <clears throat> Iowa, and elsewhere. So just pay attention. Be aware. That's all we're asking, right? Again, so many distractions. Finally, day three shifts east even a little bit more. Then it's probably going to cool off a little bit after that, both literally in the atmosphere, a little bit of a cool period coming up east of the Rockies, and the severe weather should tamp down a little, which will give me time to get my vehicle. The Hail Project is just about, well, I launched it officially on the 10th. I'll show you a video that I really want you to watch here in just a moment. It's a two-hour podcast on YouTube, uh, sort of debuting our Hail Project, this project to study hail in the wild and show it to you like you have never seen it before. The vehicle, our Toyota Tacoma, getting modified with a vehicle-sized hail guard. Edwards Incorporated, a company here in North Carolina, is fabricating everything. and It should be ready in just a few hours. Maybe that's the guy telling me now. Nope, quite not yet. Um, text message. I was hoping it was Sean. Soon enough, though, it's going to be ready. I'll show you some pictures of it. And then we're going to be going out there into Tornado Alley because of that. That green, blue look there in the thumbnail of the very first episode of our new limited edition series, The Hail Project Podcast. My first guest, none other, trying to drop me out here, come on, than Dr. Ian Giamanco. What an incredible two-hour conversation he and I had. I invite you to watch this, listen to it, whatever. It is on YouTube in the podcast area. Thanks to our back-end people to explain to me how to make that happen. And I'm going to be doing more of these. We're going to have different people coming on talking about hail. It is an underreported, majorly destructive part of severe weather. Tornadoes get all the hype, and they should. But the hail does not need to be ignored. So we're going to shine a bright light on it, so to speak, and uh, introduce you to some really amazing things regarding hail. So check it out. Season 1, Episode 1 of the Hail Project Podcast with the truly remarkable Dr. Ian Giamanco. All right? And finally, before I let you go, again, I said this last week and a couple times recently, I don't want to come in here and drop all this bad news about the upcoming hurricane season and then just let you go off and worry about it and get anxiety over it. What can we do to help mitigate the potential of a coming disaster. Well, we need to talk about it. So I'm lining up people, and we're going to do these special, we call them Hurricane U, Hurricane University. It's been a while, maybe a year or so, since I've done an episode. But we're going to get people to come on and talk about insurance. How do you make sure that your insurance is adequate? How do you file claims? What do you need to look for? How does flood insurance work? We're going to address that. We're going to address mitigation with your house, your business, And then, I think, very important, the mental aspect to all of this bad news. What do we do with it? How do we process it? How do you deal with all the stress and the noise of when a hurricane is coming? We ignore our mental health way too much in this country, I do believe. And it's interesting because both of my parents were in the mental health business. 
uh, when they were still alive. And I think it, they would be proud of me for approaching it from that perspective. But yeah, you see all this bad news, these scary thumbnails, and then what? You're just left to feel sad and what am I going to do now? I say, fight back, educate yourself, do something. You know that meme that's got that guy poking something? It's like a drawing. It says, do something. Don't just absorb this bad news. Or it's not necessarily bad news. It's just news, right? It's just facts. But these facts can be upsetting. So let's do something to mitigate that and take that information and turn it into something actionable. All right, and I'm going to help you to the best of my ability to do that. And we do all of that thanks to your support. We've had a few people join up Patreon in the last several weeks, invite you to become an investor, part of our community. You help to directly fund what we do. And in return, you get access to all kinds of stuff, our Discord, all of our live cams, exclusive podcast episodes, the Hurricane Highway podcast, stories from the Hurricane Highway, plus our awesome interactive maps, and much more. And you know what? You're helping to support the future, literally. You know, like uh, Marketplace from NPR. That is supported by investors just like you guys. If you're old enough to listen to podcasts like I do, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And we're kind of the same thing. It's almost like being a nonprofit without the nonprofit paperwork and headaches. So we have a great community and I invite you to join it. You can also follow us on Patreon for free. They have allowed that, which is great. I am on Twitter. To me, it will always be Twitter. I know it's called something else, but I love the little the little white bird. Uh, at Hurricane Track. And I found out, too, you can put at Hurricane Track in YouTube, and there we are. Anyway, that's the brand. We are YouTube, uh, or Hurricane. I'm not YouTube. That'd be great if I was a billionaire. Um, but do subscribe on YouTube. And maybe one day I'll get there. Ha ha. Hey, if I ever became a billionaire, I might run for president and do things my way. But don't tempt me. Story for another day. Anyhow, good to be back with you. Hopefully this cold will be gone before next week. Not as bad as the last one because at least I can still talk. But now I need to quit talking and say goodbye to you. Have a good rest of your Monday. From all of us at Hurricane Track, thanks for watching. I'm Mark Suddeth. I'll see you again in a week.